Ki ora koutou katoa, nami hinui ki a koutou katoa, uh, ko ranga nui ke ronga, ko papatua nuku ke raro, ko na tangata ke waina nui, te he mori ora. Kia tauna mana ki tanga, a te meo naro, ki a runga, ki teina, ki teina o tato. Kia mahia te hua, ma kihi kihi, kia toi te kupu, toi te mana, toi te araha, toi te reo maori. Kia tu turu, kia whakamoa, kia tina. Uye taikie. Well, great um, pleasure to be asked to introduce Terry Lintz's seminar today. Terry works closely with me, and Terry is one of those people who it is always fun to talk to, and you always come away with a smile on your face and knowing something new. Um, Terry's a bit of a polymath. He's, a, he's um, started off doing a cell biology degree in Auckland, a bachelor master's, and then he did his PhD in the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute in Melbourne before postdoctoral and tenure track positions in um, uh, Columbia and Rockefeller in New York and um, Texas um, AMN University. And Terry came back to New Zealand in, um, I think, around 2014, 2015, yeah. and uh, did a graduate diploma of teaching, then did some uh, secondary school teaching positions before we were very lucky for Terry to start to work with us in genomics education in the University of Auckland in um, 2017. And um, the title of Terry's talk is Fitting for Purpose, Experiences in Genomic Education. Yeah, I'm looking forward to your talk, Terry. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. I'll just share my screen. Uh, Tene koutou katoa. Um, thank you all for tuning in. All right. Um, so, uh, as Chris uh, kindly introduced me, um, uh, the talk is going to be about fitting for purpose experiences in genomic education. Uh, this is uh, sort of going to be um, a series of vignettes about uh, some work that's been going on through genomics and medicine, uh, primarily uh, in terms of school outreach with uh, younger students. Um, so I'm going to start with an introduction that will just set the scene for the state of science education in New Zealand at the moment. And then I'm going to talk about um, a museum-based um, DNA sequencing outreach program that we developed in conjunction with the Auckland War Memorial Museum. Um, I'm then going to sort of step back from um, that for a moment and then talk about uh, equity as a rationale for primary school um, genomics education and uh, then discuss our implementation um, of a primary school eDNA project um, that was carried out in the Tamaki Glen Innes area of Auckland. Um, finally, at the very end, I'm just going to touch briefly on um, some of the other activities that uh, Genomics into Medicine has been doing in the um, genomics education space. So, um, uh, as has been observed for millennia, um, the fate of empires depends on the education of youth. Um, and uh, one thing that um, is uh, probably a source of concern is that we haven't been doing very well in New Zealand in terms of uh, early science education of students. And so uh, this is kind of exemplified in um, the graph on the left hand side, in which what you're seeing here is the proportion of students that at level four um, reach the level two curriculum objectives by the end of their year. As you can see, it's not too bad and looks relatively promising in terms of STEM subjects. So science, 80 plus percent of students uh, are reaching that curriculum objective. Uh, math, about 80 percent of students. So um, unfortunately, the situation doesn't look so promising when you look at um, how many year eight students, this is the last year before they um, go to secondary school, how many year eight students are reaching their level four curriculum objectives. Um, and as you can see, about 50% of those um, year eight students um, are, or oh, 40%, sorry, uh, reaching the right level in math um, for their curriculum objectives. And that brings up the question about how science performs in this light. And unfortunately, only about one in five um, students uh, are reaching curriculum objectives in science, um, which they really would ideally set them up for um, 
success um, and, and a good start to secondary school science. Um, the situation doesn't seem to improve throughout their um, years at secondary school. Um, what you see here is um, a graph of um, 2018 international um, uh, student achievement results, um, PISA studies. And as you'll be able to see, there's a decrease across the board in both math, science and reading in terms of the number of students um, that, um, uh, in terms of the scores that students achieve um, through at, by the age of 15. Um, and what you can also see here is, um, so this is the science achievement stand um, progress and that's sort of falling off quickly. Um, but you can also see um, uh, opposingly a trend in terms of the number of NCEA um, level two plus um, school leavers. So the NCEA results really tend to obscure the overall performance of students in New Zealand in science. Uh, so that um, presents a number of problems, of course, um, in terms of trying to have, develop a workforce that um, is uh, very um, able in terms of STEM subjects. Um, and so uh, what we have here is uh, sort of some data that would give you a sense of um, the general trends that seem to occur internationally as well in terms of how students think about entering into science as a career. Um, and this is the, the, an Aspire study that was conducted in the UK and is, is sort of an on, ongoing longitudinal study um, with uh, about 40,000 student surveys um, that have been uh, collated. And what you can see is that uh, students, irrespective of their age, whether they're um, year 10 or 11, 12, 13, 13, 14, or 15, 16, um, generally hold um, science in relatively high esteem. They think that there's interesting things that can be learned in science, that their parents think science is important, and that scientists do valuable work. Um, what you'll also note is that very few of them um, would actually like to be a scientist. Um, and in fact, science comes out as probably being, I think it was the third least favored um, profession that students from this cohort were interested in, in moving into. Uh, you'll also note that there's a sort of a, a fall off in terms of the interest in science that um, uh, is age dependent. And in fact, in New Zealand also, um, what you see is that there tends to be sort of a re reducing interest in science from about year seven onwards. Now, um, part of that um, may relate to the fact that unfortunately in New Zealand, um, most primary school teachers are not um, uh, skilled in science education and don't have great levels of science knowledge. Um, in fact, only about 14% of primary teachers in New Zealand have had some science training. Um, and that compares with an, an international average of about 41%. And some nations have um, the percentage of primary school teachers who have been trained in science as high as 85% or more. Moreover, um, in New Zealand, uh, teachers in, at primary school level spend relatively little time on a per weekly basis in terms of science education with their students. So uh, the average amount of time devoted to science in, at primary school level in New Zealand is 60 minutes per week. So that's 63 minutes per week. So that's roughly half of the international average. But 50% of New Zealand um, primary school students um, are exposed to only about 45 minutes um, of science per week. And 10% of those students had less than um, 15 minutes worth of science content per week. So um, I think there are sort of very substantial um, structural problems with science education in New Zealand. Um, and part of this is because there has been a very, very strong push over uh, many years to uh, work on numeracy and literacy um, and the development of student um, competencies and capabilities. But 
unfortunately to the exclusion of um, sort of knowledge-based um, science education. Um, so that was, that's kind of the background um, as to where we are at the moment. And um, in uh, an effort to sort of try and uh, address some of these issues and to um, foster some, a, a greater understanding of um, genomics um, and fundamental aspects of biology in the, in the, um, the public at large, um, Genomics into Medicine held a symposium uh, in 2018 at the University of Auckland. And in that symposium, we brought together um, scientists and uh, educators from across the Auckland region to um, share uh, experiences of working in science outreach and to try and identify for genomics into medicine um, what particular approach we might take that would um, be most effective. And so what came out of that, along with conversations with um, uh, the Auckland Museum um, staff, was that uh, we would try and design a program in which uh, students between the ages of, uh, or between year seven and year 10 at school, so middle school students, um, where they would come into the museum in a half day program and take part, of, part in and witness um, some live nanopore sequencing at the museum. And in addition, they would have some lab practical activity that would go along with that. Other design constraints in terms of how we tried to structure this program was that um, the program would be related to um, one of the museum's natural history exhibits. Um, it, ideally, it would have some sort of biomedical feel to it um, or relationship to that, uh, which would sort of fit with our genomics into medicine remit. Um, and that ultimately the program would be self-sustaining for the museum staff so that they would be able to continue um, running the program without requiring assistance from um, uh, researchers. Uh, in order to do this, we also uh, developed for students um, some prior learning that would sort of get them up to the point um, where they would be able to, over the course of a week or two, um, have sufficient knowledge to be able to come into the, uh, into the museum and then um, make the most of uh, the experience. So uh, this is an example of one of the things that was done within the classroom before students went to the museum. And they're presented with a little, a, um, a fake um, Department of Conservation case report in which a, a Kiwi, um, a dead Kiwi was, was found and DNA was taken from the wound site. Um, and the students are to use that in terms of identifying, as a, as a means to identify um, uh, which particular animal might have been responsible for the, the death of the kiwi. And so as part and parcel of that process, um, what they did was they were given um, short sequence reads, uh, more or less as one might expect um, would happen uh, in real life perhaps, um, and then construct a, a consensus from those short sequence reads that um, uh, had some sort of errors uh, inserted into them. Uh, so they, the consensus was, was required and that was kind of in order to sort of set them up for some of the issues um, associated with nanopore sequencing. Um, once they'd constructed the consensus sequence, then they put that into um, uh, BLAST and um, then they were able to identify the species that was involved and with a little bit more digging, um, they were able to um, narrow it down to a particular breed of dog um, that then they could sort of attribute um, the, the death of the Kiwi to um, a dog that was roving in the, in the local area. So that was uh, sort of one of the uh, sets of tasks that we set students um, in, in the classroom and that kind of gave them some of the information they needed in terms of taking multiple sequence reads um, and then doing blast searches to try and identify um, a particular species. Uh, now, when we, in terms of the um, uh, the scenario that we tried to develop, um, this was also a, a fiction, um, and the, it was really related to um, 
the heavy-footed mower that was in the, um, the natural history part of the museum, uh, which has quite a sort of a disproportionate uh, odd body morphology. And so um, that's sort of shown here, um, this particular specimen here. Um, and so the question that we sort of posed was um, that how did the big-footed mower evolve such a heavy bone structure? And in order to sort of follow this um, sort of line of fiction, we needed to identify a particular candidate gene and also a source of um, MOA DNA sequence that could be sort of used in this context. Um, at the time, uh, the only significant MOA genome sequence data um, it was for the little bush MOA. Um, this was um, obtained um, by Alan Baker and his colleagues working in Toronto and, and at Harvard. Um, and so that sequence data had been sort of um, put into the archives um, online, um, but hadn't been sort of fully published at that point in time. Um, taking a, a blasting that sequence with um, the chicken PIDX1 gene, identified a match to a particular um, a scaffold within that sequencing project. And so uh, with that information, we were able to um, have um, IDT uh, produce a synthetic G block DNA that we then cloned into Blue, Strip, Blue Script, and then that DNA was used um, when in the museum as the sequencing target when students came in for their half day visit. So we sort of extracted all the complexity of dealing with ancient DNA completely out of the picture um, so that we could uh, run this sort of uh, artificial scenario, but with a relatively high probability of success. Um, and just to um, uh, sort of solidify the, the, the story, um, uh, the reason that we chose PIDX1 um, as the target candidate gene for the, this uh, little study um, was that it's known to be a determinant of hind limb identity. Um, and this provided some sort of opportunities also for students to learn a, bit, a little bit about how the um, vertebrate body plan is established, um, how uh, different axial positional identities are formed. Um, and uh, as you can see here, um, there's um, uh, in the, uh, a mouse embryo schematic at E9.5 days. Um, you can sort of see in red here the regions where PIDX1 is expressed. And um, you can also see that at uh, E12.5 with the um, significant expression in the hind limb. And in the little diagram here, you can sort of see in the lateral plate mesoderm, um, sort of the signaling cascade um, between PIDX1, uh, TBX4, and FGFs which are involved in um, sort of specifying some aspect of that identity of the hind limb. Um, and down below that, you can sort of see what happens uh, in the event with different um, uh, breed, avian breeds um, of decreasing the PITX1 level of expression. Um, and then what you see is that um, the, the legs develop, or at least the surface ectoderm of the legs, um, develops a more forelimb like um, identity uh, with a lot of feather, feathering, which is kind of like a wing. In addition to that, um, the PIDX1 um, gene has also been implicated in um, clubfoot uh, in situations where there's haploinsufficiency. And um, also, if there's ectopic expression of PIDX1 in the forelimb, um, then it trans transforms the forelimb into more of a lower limb character in terms of some of the bones that develop. And so that, that's uh, Liebenberg syndrome. So that sort of fitted nicely with being able to sort of in inject some medical um, information into the, um, into the pro project itself. Um, so, um, Everything went, went relatively smoothly in terms of the sequencing. Um, students were able to, while they're at the museum, receive data um, from, those, um, uh, from the sequencing that was done on site and use that data um, to um, blast some sequences uh, against the database and identify that the DNA um, was relatively highly matched to um, the DNA of other paleonates. 
and there was a couple of differences that they could conjecture might be conceivably responsible for, as far as they were concerned, um, the particular um, uh, heavy boned morphology of the heavy footed knot. Um, one of the things that came out from the survey um, of these students was that, um, and this was a very consistent theme, was that they really especially enjoyed um, uh, donning the accoutrements of, um, of a scientist, being in lab coats, wearing glasses, safety glasses, uh, wearing gloves, uh, using a vortex mixer, um, and preparing DNA in the classroom uh, from banana or the pipetting and DNA extraction steps that were done um, uh, within while they're at the museum themselves. So from the point of view of sort of trying to encourage students to sort of think about um, adopting uh, science as a career, it's sort of important that they can sort of envisage themselves in that situation. And so um, these kind of uh, outreach events where they're able to do sort of work at the bench um, seems to be a, a one potential way forward to try and encourage um, that, those kind of career decisions. Okay, um, so I'm just going to pause here for a moment and um, backtrack a little bit and talk a little bit about um, uh, science education and equity and where genomics um, and uh, information about DNA and molecular biology uh, might be valuable um, in terms of equity, which doesn't necessarily seem to be a straightforward um, link. So I'm just going to just talk you through that. So um, over here, what we have is um, a Ministry of Education um, report on science literacy achievement, again, using the 2018 um, International PISA Science Scores. And in this case, what you see is that um, science scores for New Zealand um, students, these are 15 year olds, um, do track with um, the socioeconomic status of their families. Um, you can sort of see that there's a, a downward trend in, across the years for each um, uh, socioeconomic status group. Um, but the main factor that I want you to note here is obviously that there's a very strong relationship between socioeconomic status and, um, and achievement, which of course is not at all a surprise and has been found the world over. But I think that the, the, the important thing that we really need to ask ourselves is why is it that New Zealand of all places has the strongest relationship between socioeconomic background um, and performance? Um, this is even when you put it up against um, other PISA comparative countries such as Australia, Canada, the US and the UK. So why should be that this be the case? What, what is the possible explanations for the strength of this relationship uh, in New Zealand. And being a little bit provocative, um, I'll put forward the notion that um, part of this might be to do with the curriculum. So um, it has been observed by uh, Michael Young, who's, who's a curriculum theorist, um, who has uh, started off as a science teacher, that based on his experience of going th through um, post-apartheid South African uh, education as a teacher and the convulsions in um, curriculum as different curriculum uh, curricula sort of structures and focuses were um, instituted that um, his conclusion from those studies was that an underspecified curriculum advantages those who are already advantaged um, and by extension um, disadvantages those who are already disadvantaged and the significance of that to us, I think, is that New Zealand has a very underspecified curriculum. Um, the, the real focus of the New Zealand curriculum um, is on uh, developing learner capabilities and capacities. And while um, uh, that seem, and, and it's a very learner centric, and while that may seem um, uh, all well and good, there, there is potentially a downside. Now, um, uh, Young has also um, talked about the fact that 
different forms of knowledge have their specific merits. And he makes a distinction of powerful knowledge as being something that knowledge that is both specialized and differentiated. And that is specialized in that it comes from typically a particular discipline of human endeavor and differentiated in that it's distinct from the experiences that students bring to school as part of their everyday knowledge. And such knowledge is powerful because it enables students to build a sophisticated and valuable schema um, that helps explain and predict aspects of their lived and future lives. So um, in light of that, um, that, that focus on powerful knowledge, um, it's interesting and perhaps a little bit um, worrying to note that most primary school science um, closely relates to general everyday knowledge. And that's not surprising because it's, they're taking a very learner centric stance where the children um, of students sort of direct their science um, interests. And in fact, a 2021 um, Education Review Office report um, has sort of doubled down on that and, and advocates learner centered approaches and moving away from programs that focus on science knowledge. Which brings us to our eDNA outreach project um, of the Omaru um, Awa um, in, in Auckland. And in order to sort of have students um, get the most from this program, um, we needed to develop um, a lot of classroom learning that would support that um, uh, eDNA sampling and support their understanding of what DNA is all about. And so there's, was, it was kind of inescapable that that was not going to be a learning approach, but more of a knowledge-based approach. And so what I'm going to be showing you in the next few slides is what that, um, how that program, um, program was implemented and what the response of students was to it. Just to give you a, a sense of um, the, the location and the demography of the area, um, this is uh, the demographic breakdown of um, students from uh, the year um, 2019 cohort. Uh, these are responses from 107 students showing um, the number of students that sort of um, self assign themselves to particular um, uh, specific groups. Um, many of them uh, trace their heritage back to uh, multiple Pacific Islands. Um, but as you can sort of see, uh, it's very, um, uh, there are a lot of Pacific students, uh, some Maori students, um, but in terms of New Zealand European students, none of the, all of those few New, Ze New Zealand European students were there, um, uh, also had some Maori or Pacifica um, heritage. These are the schools that uh, we were sort of primarily working with, um, these primary schools. And the um, program that um, we developed, so this is really my working with uh, a languaging expert, Gani Van Hees, um, started off taking students first through uh, a bit of an understanding about evolution and adaptations, uh, on through cellular organization, then to DNA and the genome, um, and then to how um, the, the code on code codes for proteins before they would go to do the eDNA sampling as sort of the capstone of the project. Um, even from the, the get-go, um, the concept of evolution was quite new to many students um, and um, they really enjoyed activities that we sort of established around this tree of life. Um, we also um, uh, were very careful in terms of selecting particular organisms that we wanted the students to investigate. Um, as George Orwell said, um, you know, all animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others. And so one of the things that we did was we sort of directed students' attention to um, the octopus. Um, and months and months later, when we ran a final survey, um, many of those students were still sort of expressed their fascination with um, the octopus and its three hearts and its eight brains or, or nine brains, eight ganglia in each, uh, and a ganglia in each arm, and it's blue blood and things like that. So it really had an impression on them. And we started them off um, by watching sort of this amazing little video from uh, Roger Hanlon of an octopus sort of changing color and materializing before um, uh, 
uh, his eyes. So um, this is kind of in some ways also different from the student centric approach where you might just say to the student, go and find an animal that you're interested in and do some research on that. Uh, by directing their attention, I think we were able to sort of uh, highlight things that were really quite compelling. Um, the second phase of the program was to um, have students investigate um, and find out about the cellular basis of life. Um, we were very fortunate that the university at the time was um, uh, uh, changing its um, uh, the microscopes, switching out the microscopes that had been used for medical student education and replacing them with newer models. And so we were able to get quite a few microscopes that we were able to distribute to the different schools that were involved in the program. And microscopy was a big hit, um, particularly when students did a cheek cell practical and then collected stained um, and then observed under the microscope their own cheek cells and being able to see the nuclei, um, being able to sort of see how small the cells were relative to their expectations. Um, so that was uh, a, a very successful aspect of the program in terms of generating students' interest. Um, in addition to that, um, and also that's not particularly scalable perhaps, in addition to that, we developed a, a, a sort of an exercise that involved them looking at um, using a, an online zebrafish atlas from the Cheng Lab in uh, University of Pennsylvania. And um, what they were able to do was just sort of navigate through um, this annotated atlas, um, looking at um, different slides. Um, this is uh, four days post fertilization, uh, 21 to 29 days post fertilization, for example and then uh, browse through sort of high resolution, good quality microscopy images um, to look at such things as, you know, how different cell types and tissues differentiate uh, through the developmental process. Um, and also address very simple questions. For example, when an, uh, an embryo grows, is it, is it growing because there are more cells or because the cells are bigger? Um, so they got a lot out of that and, and quite enjoyed the process of looking at zebrafish. Um, as we'll just go back one slide. Um, as you could see, um, you know, one um, student at the very end of the program commented that um, they were very interested in learning about these little fish because they have a very high percentage of genes that are similar to the genes in humans. The next step of the program um, was to introduce students to the structure and um, function of DNA. Um, the, the young um, person in the middle panel. Um, has just finished um, successfully a, a task that was and carry out chromosomes that um, are double helical um, made out of rope uh, and those human chromosomes were just sort of bundled into a waffle ball a wiffle ball sorry a wiffle ball um, uh, which is kind of like a you know mimicking a nucleus with nuclear pores um, and then they sorted those chromosomes based on their lengths and on um, genes that were marked, 50 genes that were marked on the chromosomes. Um, and then they, it was accompanied by a little uh, resource, their DNA dictionary, which gave a little indication of what each of those genes, um, which, were, which were chosen based on their position within chromosomes as well as their function, um, what sorts of the biological processes those genes um, contributed to. Following that, the students were given um, an, a, a, some sort of uh, an easy way into looking at how um, uh, DNA uh, within genes codes for um, amino acid structure um, in proteins. And so we started off with a little um, set of uh, basically an emoji codon ring uh, where they would sort of determine um, uh, particular meanings from sentences based on. Um, an emoji code, and then they would move on to uh, understanding that those emojis were re representing uh, nucleotides and that the outer ring of the codon chart represented amino acids. And then they looked a little bit at protein structure. So um, at the end of the, the classroom learning phase of the project, um, students were given um, an opportunity to demonstrate what they learned. And uh, one aspect of that was that they were given two minutes to write down 
um, some science terms that they had picked up and, and committed to memory um, over the course of the preceding uh, two terms of work. And so this is a, um, a, a breakdown of those terms that were um, recalled by 5% um, or more of the students. And as you can sort of see, um, there's um, over 80, around about 80% of students um, wrote down nucleus, chromosomes. Um, you will see, note that uh, quite a few students uh, remembered subcellular organelles like the ribosome, the Golgi, um, endoplasmic reticulum, mitochondria, et cetera. Um, students all remembered you know, the, the nucleosides um, uh, and often sort of tended to favor um, you know, using the words themselves rather than just simply ACGNT. Uh, you'll notice the octopus, this is, so this is months after they've watched the octopus video and researched that, octopus and zebrafish um, come up. So there's a sort of a rich um, terminological vocabulary that students were able to capture. Most of the students, um, this is the sort of the number of terms recalled, uh, most of the students remembered more than um, eight terms, um, some well into the 20s. There was no great difference between the number of um, terms nor the complexity of those terms remembered by year seven students versus year eight students, which would be something that, um, if that had been the case, would have signaled that the, um, the information was perhaps at too high a level if, if the younger students had struggled significantly. But because there was not really any difference um, in terms of the terms recalled, we feel that uh, the, the, the program itself was pitched at the right level. Um, in blue here are just some other terms that um, uh, students recalled in their two minutes of um, free recall. And, and what you'll notice in the questions uh, in the uh, comments down below that when students were asked what they liked most about the, 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 the program, um, this was at the point in time where they were still doing classwork more, um, was that quite a few of the students actually really focused on the fact that they liked genomics because they found that the words were interesting. Um, and that learning about cells and the contents of cells might give them a jump start when they go to, to secondary school. And I'll also alert you or direct your attention to the bottom comment, which is that um, the student really enjoyed genomics and learning about neurons and the tree of life. Um, but he enjoyed, uh, he or she, sorry, enjoyed um, being able to help their friends when they needed help. And so this would be um, what one in um, education speak would um, term um, being within the zone of um, proximal development, which is a, a phrase coined by the Russian um, developmental psychologist um, Lev Vygotsky. Um, and basically it's the Goldilocks point between um, in terms of subject matter where something is too difficult for a student to manage and grasp concepts on their own, but with a more capable other. Um, so in this case, this particular student who's writing the comment or a teacher, um, they, those students are then able to understand that content. So that also suggests that the way we pitch the program um, in terms of the amount of knowledge that was required and the, the complexity of the terminology was um, suitable for these year seven and year eight students. Um, now I won't go uh, a lot into the details um, at all of the data that came out of the, the sampling um, from the AWA, but um, what um, we did was basically the five schools that were involved, uh, each sampled from a, a region on the Awa that was very close to the school. Um, and we were enormously helped in this process by um, uh, two PhD students from uh, Kim Handley's lab. So um, we have uh, Emily Gios and um, uh, Olivia Mosley here. Um, and they are at this point in time sort of showing, um, talking to students about how they're going to handle um, the filter after the, the, the water that the students collected is filtered through the apparatus to collect um, uh, material that would then be used for eDNA analysis. Um, that uh, material was prepped in the lab um, with the help of um, Emily and then um, I was very fortunate to have um, 
uh, a lot of help from Annabelle Woodley, who sort of uh, shepherded me through the, um, the nanopore sequencing stage of things, which we ran on a, um, a nanopore um, MK1C, Mark 1C device. Um, and Annabelle also did some of the bioinformatics um, work. And then Peter Sai and Chris also did some additional bioinformatics to give a sort of an, an end product that the students could explore um, interactively. And that was these Krona plots. Um, and they really enjoyed sort of navigating their way through those plots, um, trying to identify which particular um, animals were or plants or bacteria were present based on the, um, the taxonomic names. Um, learning that came out of this was in term, um, sort of how dwarfed uh, the eukaryote contribution to DNA, eDNA was relative to the um, microbial prokaryote contributions. Um, so it was a, a, um, a sort of a very interesting representation for students to sort of explore through and they really enjoyed that activity. Um, there were some interesting differences between the different sites that were collected, but in, in the interest of time, I won't go into that here. Uh, so lessons learned from this process. Um, uh, one is that uh, things take a lot longer than you would anticipate in terms of the learning, um, the working around other commitments within schools, the commitments that the teachers have to other programs that are running simultaneously. Um, so it's quite a, a, a um, complex dynamic uh, environment to be trying to work in. Um, and because things take a very long time, um, in order to get to the sort of depth that we were wanting to get to with these students, uh, it really requires substantial buy-in from teachers. Um, and of course, much of this information is completely new to the teachers themselves. So um, there, I, I um, think that you know, the, the, the impact of the teachers and getting them to um, really work with the students and, and deliver this uh, information is something that really needs to be built up and one of the, the bigger issues I think with um, the situation for teachers is that they get precious little um, professional development time to sort of build on their, their, their science training or lack thereof. Um, despite the, the level of work that was required by the teachers, I think um, they all felt that it was um, very worthwhile because I think the students responded very positively to the fact that they were, they were being challenged by um, information that was deep knowledge that was not what they would normally be able to um, uh, observe and bring in to school as everyday knowledge. Um, so they were really seeing that there was like new vistas of information out there for them to sort of um, you know, open their eyes to. So it was very motivating, I think, um, that they uh, had that perspective. Um, the, the project has been um, sort of recognized in a couple of um, uh, publications, which has been very nice, and hopefully it might prompt um, other um, schools to consider doing something along these lines. Uh, so I'm just going to talk about, for a moment about curricular um, implications and um, uh, Michael Young, again, um, who's from the sort of the social realist school of thought in terms of curriculum theory, um, proposes that a, a, an important question that we should be asking them ourselves would be, you know, how would a curriculum differ if entitlement to knowledge was its goal? And um, I think uh, I fundamentally believe that um, the sort of information that we were providing to these students and this, these year seven and eight students is um, sort of a really should be a birthright um, that you know all students should be exposed to that kind of information um, because that's going to allow them, for example, to understand issues that might relate to the their healthcare or the health of their whanau um, as they mature and go on through life. And in the absence of this kind of program for students of this youngish age many students will not be exposed to such information. Um, another interesting perspective is that um, there is um, some data to suggest that uh, an appropriately constructed genetics slash genomics um, curriculum um, focusing on multifactorial genetics 
may decrease um, the um, uh, the notions that students often form as a, on the basis of their first exposures to Mendelian genetics, and that is um, that things are quite deterministic, and that this um, sort of uh, exacerbates or helps promote sort of essentialist beliefs and sort of uh, and some degrees of racial bias. And so I think there's a, perhaps a moral imperative to actually try and produce a national genomics curriculum um, for young students that's um, knowledge rich and that ultimately um, might generationally help decrease systemic racism. Um, I, I won't uh, go into these um, resources um, at the moment, but just to say that um, if you, uh, we would be very happy for you to um, access these two sets of resources, which uh, really try and address sort of issues of equity um, and also um, provide a, the, the one on unlocking life's code, provide sort of a, a general introduction to um, DNA and proteins and um, uh, cell biology. Um, and so is probably appropriate for students from anywhere between the ages of uh, from year seven through to year 10. Um, whereas this uh, resource, the Genomic Revolution, is primarily tailored to, towards um, year 12, year 13 students and directly addresses many of the sort of ethical issues that go along with um, the, the advances in genomics within society. Oh, and if you do access those, um, then we'll be able to sort of uh, hopefully pinpoint you on the map um, because of the way the resources are structured. Uh, the, the links that are held within those resources um, uh, are, become associated with IP addresses that we can then track. So this is the current uh, distribution of usage of those two resources um, over the last year. All right, so uh, in the last moment um, of the talk, um, I just want to um, say that um, the Genomics and Medicine Initiative has also been sort of heavily engaged in trying to develop um, educational resources for um, uh, future and present um, current professionals, health professionals. And um, the way that we're doing this in part is through um, development of um, uh, medical school curriculum for medical students. Um, uh, and that's been done in conjunction with um, uh, Diane Kenwright, um, who we've sort of discussed this um, with over quite a number of years, uh, Diane and her colleagues. Um, and in addition to that, uh, we're uh, uh, beginning to sort of develop a, um, a micro-credential course um, that's very modular in its design. So this modularity is sort of um, exemplified in our current thinking uh, on this table on the left, in which um, teachers, cancer clinicians, um, uh, geneticists, uh, research scientists, or, or people working in primary care um, may take um, particular modules within this course um, uh, once it comes into sort of full fruition. Uh, this uh, work has been sort of um, uh, supported by Genomics Aotearoa um, in terms of uh, developing um, these courses. Uh, partly through the gen uh, genomics uh, cancer oncology um, uh, capability building fund uh, as part of genomics at Aotearoa and also um, uh, funds that have been sort of um, uh, put aside for the development of these micro-credential courses. Um, because of COVID, uh, things have kind of got in the way a little bit. And so we're um, at present trying to combine these two objectives um, and uh, led by um, Polona lucanes um, we uh, are about to run a pilot program um, of uh, genomics for um, cancer clinicians. And in that pilot program, um, in this trial um, that we will be conducting uh, relatively soon, uh, we'll be able to sort of take lessons that we need um, in terms of how best to deliver this kind of material um, in a sort of a mixed mode with both uh, online and uh, in-person uh, participants. Finally, I just want to um, give some acknowledgements. Um, uh, uh, 
Peter, Emily, Olivia, and Annabelle um, were very important in terms of being able to uh, do the um, uh, eDNA um, part of the project for the South Side um, students. Um, a large number, the only band here was uh, a sort of uh, central in terms of the development of the uh, classroom resources that were given to students and the sort of languaging that went behind that. Um, of course, the teachers themselves um, contributed hugely to the success of that program, uh, which was funded by um, uh, Curious Minds MB through Southside, as well as through the um, Rotary, the Jean Grey Charitable Trust, and the New Zealand Tally Medicine Trust, and Genomics into Medicine. Uh, the museum project was run, um, led by uh, Thames and Rob in Chris's lab, um, and the, from the university side of things, and Tom Rollins was the, the lead person in the, um, on the museum side of the museum project, um, with also a lot of help from Flona um, and many others. Um, and then, uh, as I said, although I didn't really talk very much about it, um, in terms of the course development, um, a, a, a very large number of people over many years have contributed um, to this. Um, Kimmy is um, producing, has produced an excellent um, module uh, and standalone course on indigenous genomics. Uh, Polona is leading the, um, the uh, course for uh, cancer uh, clinics for about sort of kickoff. And, um, as I said before, um, some of the work on uh, medical school curricula has been done in, in, in conjunction um, in discussion with uh, Diane Kenwright and her colleagues. Um, so I'm just going to leave that um, there. Um, I hope I haven't run on too long.